Where is your red line? No losses? Make as much as inflation or make as much money as you can. How much pain can you take? Investors need to find out what their red line is and how it moves. The Red Line Money podcast can help you find it. Redline Money takes the expertise of David Roach and Richard Harris as they talk markets, prices, bubbles and busts, and some even more interesting topics. David and Richard have nearly a century between them of searching for the red line in bull markets and bear. Hear what the crowd isn't saying about current markets and price moves in the long term and even longer. Back to the Egyptians. See markets as an engineering system, a biological organism, or as the behaviour of subatomic particles. You don't get this anywhere else, and you know it makes sense. We've been thinking a little bit about the environment recently. Earth Day was very, you know, big deal. The US and China both involved, both talking about their commitments to climate change in the future. We've got the COP26 talks coming up in November in Glasgow. So I guess we'll kick off with our resident eco expert, that's Nick Kennedy of Independent Strategy, by just talking us through some of the most recent proposals and how they differ between the US and China in particular. The big thing really was Biden's, I suppose, Biden's commitment to reduce US emissions by 50, 52% from 2005 levels by 2030. The Chinese didn't actually offer anything specific. They just offered encouraging words and suggested that, I guess, once COP26 comes up, they'll have to put more binding numbers on things. But so far, they've just sort of talked the right talk. It's quite a big step for the US because really, they haven't been on a trajectory where emissions have been falling at a rate that would start to impact climate potentially. So that's, that's where they're starting from. There's other more modest commitments like creating more finance for rainforest preservation, something I'm particularly fond of, and also more development funds for just generally helping clean up energy systems, particularly in the developing world and the emerging world. I don't think there was anything particularly groundbreaking at this stage. Well, actually, there's some interesting figures from Bloomberg, and they've chosen a funny period 2010 to 2030. The UK is suggesting a fall of 59% in emissions in that period. The EU, 47. Brazil, 46. All of those seem fairly wild. US is 34. But China, India, and Turkey are going up by 155 to 180%. So you kind of have to think, even though we've got ambitious and probably politically driven targets from UK, EU, et cetera, China, India, and Turkey is just going to blow the whole thing out of the water. Yes, I mean, undoubtedly that's true. China accounts for about 30, 35% of total global emissions. It outputs more than double the US now. Really, in per capita terms, US emissions peaked in about 1972 and have been on a kind of slightly downward path ever since. But China's have just basically, since they joined the WTO, it's moved up exponentially. They, they slowed in sort of since about 2016. They've started to slow down, but I mean, the, the trajectory is still higher. This, their energy system is still very coal dependent despite their investments in things like solar and wind and battery storage and that kind of stuff. So yeah, you need to get China on board. If you look at things globally, and if you assume that the world could do what Biden has promised, um, reduce emissions by 50% from 2005 levels, in fact, world emissions would be back to where they were in about 1965, mainly because since 2005, places like China and, and India have seen emissions rise massively. So, and bear in mind, even if back in 2005, I mean, the world was still warming up. So the levels that we've got to come down to, it's a substantial lot of work to do. And, and there's still the vested interest at work. Like Biden's big thing was creating high paying union jobs to drive the green revolution. So you can see that the focus is still very much on the economy over the environment. I mean, obviously it's driven by the environment, but if you wanted to be more aggressive about it, you could be more aggressive about it. And they haven't been. Um, so they, they don't want to upset the apple cart too much. They don't view it as an existential crisis yet. Can I come in on uh, an, the economic theory of actually doing something about the climate? The first is that the dividend discount value of all the economies in the world falls to zero if you screw it up, because eventually there will be a catastrophe. And that can be in 20 years, it could be in 10 years. We don't know what the real effects of global warming are. The other is to say, well, the only way to actually do anything about that potentially catastrophic economic 
outcome is to actually regulate it. So you stop people driving cars which have high emissions and all that sort of thing. And the third way of doing things is really to take uh, the idea that you came up with in Rhino, which is that you actually make it profitable, productive. These are good investments that do something about the climate. Now, there are three options. There's no silver bullet. I mean, you need to preserve all aspects of the ecosystem. And whatever you push into it, you need to take out of it, basically, to keep that balance. So as we wrote in the Rhino report, the idea that you can use the natural environment to, or preser preservation of the natural environment to help with that is key. And, and to do that, you need market forces to stop things like deforestation, because it's just a poor economic decision. And the reason why it's a poor economic decision is because there is no upfront cost to it. And that's partly because of all the other problems we have with emissions generally and in, in the industrialization of the world that don't price emissions properly. So it, everything feeds off each other. So really, you need to get to a system whereby carbon emissions are priced correctly and let markets do their work. The problem with that is everyone is still focused on very much on their own national economy and competition between each other. That's called the free rider problem, isn't it? Whereby I do nothing about my emissions. I just can't kind of carry on and hope that the Americans will do something about theirs and therefore the world is okay. So actually I get a free ride. That's the free rider theory, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's more mercenary than that, really. I think it's a case of if, if you can see that the, the US are going to be tightening up on their emissions and you think you've got an edge to press for your economy to benefit more immediately from that, you'll take it. It's almost the anti-vaxxer thing, you know, it's the beggar my neighbour. But, but actually, I think if we're looking realistically, the realistic direction of travel is to improve things towards the environment. Now, it's not enough. It's very slow. But obviously, electric cars and these kind of things are coming in. The issue with that, of course, is that nobody's looking at the end-to-end -end costs. They always say, oh, electric cars have no emissions. But the sheer emissions required to produce them are very high. Even things like hydrogen fuel cells are very expensive, very experimental technology. But one will produce very few emissions. Even that will need some quite significant resources as well. And you'll need a lot of mechanisms in place when those batteries come to the end of their natural working lives. You know, they don't last yeah. forever. So, so actually, we're all talking about the catastrophe that will come. It may be the catastrophe has to come before people really appreciate what's going to happen. If you take China, for instance, or even India, with the issues with emissions and people suffering from enormous issues of lung disease, at the end of the day, it's these national countries that are resisting the approach to clean up their air that are actually the very people that are killing their own citizens. Yeah, I mean, people overstate the importance of people dying generally um, and the people abusing their citizens because dead citizens aren't around to complain, but the survivors that have a higher economic livelihood as a consequence are. So therefore, you're only catering for the survivors, really. You don't care about how many people get thrown under the bus in the interim. No, but the survivors don't be one of the people thrown under the bus. So they will still have a big voice. Well, they've gone then, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, and, and, the SC, and you talk about resources as well. I mean, no one thinks about the resources of how much energy it takes to produce a litre of gasoline and the energy inputs. I mean, clearly, an electric car is far more generous in terms of the amount of its environmental footprint on its inputs. I mean, you build a wind turbine and you plug it in. That's it. You want to fill up a, an SUV if you want to go through the refining, mining, refining, cracking, distribution process of that. I mean, people talk about a lack of productivity. It seems to me that that's probably the biggest uplift in productivity for the entire transport system for a very, very long time, moving away from fossil fuels. I think we do have some really good news, which is nothing that really matters is going to be done about this in a timely fashion. So things will be done, but it won't get rid of the final kind of human wipeout as a consequence. Perhaps we'll be gone before that, and perhaps we won't. But the really good news is that things are going to be done, and we have to tell investors how they actually benefit from that. Well, the whole ESG movement has been enormous with people putting money into various ESG funds. Now, of course, the accent's often on the governments, but if there is money going into funds, then hopefully there'll be investment going into environmental companies. Except they've outperformed so much. I was looking at them in some venerable institutions' charts last night, and that's not exactly discovering uh, the holy grail, is it? I mean, everybody's piled into this stuff. What you really have to look at is, well, I'm not saying I know anything about it, but they kind of look for people who make diggers and shovels who 
that will be used to, you know, dig drains or take people's sewage out of lakes or stuff like that. I mean, maybe you're moving towards a time where instead of buying into or investing in solar panels and batteries and that sort of thing, you're actually at the point now you should be looking at the hard infrastructure that has to be made and, and saying that's a defensive sector because a lot of those stocks have actually not moved nearly as much. I don't know what you think, Nick. At the end of the day, the economy is going to be reworked to providing these more environmentally and economically productive methods of I don't know, energy generation, transport infrastructure. So you're going to have to move in that direction. But um, I mean, one of the reasons why the ESG has seen so many inflows is because that's just the trend. That's where it's going to go. And if you're going to transition, you're going to need a lot more money in that area. Well, you know, they used to say, well, there's muck, there's brass. So sooner or later, uh, there's going to be some brass in the muck. Exactly. And you know this is going to be a long-term st structural shift. There's no going back from it. You can't suddenly go, well, actually, this is, we're not going to bother about this. Let's just live with a warmer world. Because as you know, Dave, as you said earlier, um, it gets much warmer. There might not be many people about to enjoy this warm world. I'm Carolyn Wright, and I've been speaking to David Roach and Nick Kennedy of Independent Strategy and Richard Harris of Port Shelter Investment Management. Music is by Tim Moore from Pixabay, and Redline Money is produced in Hong Kong. Music